Welcome to Southern Salon Podcast. I'm Amy Clark Spain. And I'm Brittany Robertson. We've had some exciting things happen that we want to talk to you about. And we decided to podcast yesterday because we needed it. And it's been a while. And we've had some things happen that we want to talk about. It is therapy. Oh, it is really therapy. It's good therapy. We we um, actually have a lot of fun things planned, too, as far as... We do. um, people that we've lined up to kind of speak with. And I know Amy and I are in the same scenario. And then we'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a few minutes here. But we got all these awesome ideas that we're trying to do while trying to juggle work and family and side avenues. So we're we're getting there. We've we are so excited to be able to podcast when we get the chance and got all these great ideas swirling. So we're going to hold ourselves accountable and and get those things tackled. And so I was trying to decide what should the theme be because I kind of like to have something to organize it around. And I texted you last night and I said, what if we talk about fear? And the, the what that seems to be the one thing that holds people back. And I mean, when I say fear, I'm talking about that being a big umbrella, you know, maybe not being afraid to do it, but finding excuses for not doing it, for not being in and doing something that you've always wanted to do, that's been tugging at your heart. And so I think as we talk to you about our stories and what we've done, we can talk to you about how we've overcome that. Well, no, I'm not going to say overcome because we manage it. It never goes away because every new, as these things that we're doing evolve and we take on new opportunities and new challenges, those old habits are going to come up again and you just have to learn how to manage them. And so we aren't experts at that. We're not psychologists, but I think we can sort of compare notes on how we do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that I feel like, <laughs> as Amy was talking about this, because we we have, and this is, as she said, this is a huge umbrella. I mean, when you think about fear of doing things or stepping out, that's, I mean, that's a multitude of things, whether it's a job, whether it's, you know, something you're doing for your family, whether it's you know, a business endeavor, whether, you know, whatever it is, signing up for mission work or volunteer work or whatever. Anytime you step out, I think we have the, or at least I do anyway, I have the wrong tendency to look at other people and think they've got it all together. Like they know what they're doing. Like I don't, I'm lacking because I feel scared or because I feel nervous or because I feel iffy, I don't feel like I'm the right kind of person to do this because I'm like, well, I have these second thoughts and I'm nervous and I'm anxious and I just don't think I'm going to be able to do it because look at everybody else. The truth is, if we could peel back the layers of everybody else, they probably feel the same way. They're just, as Amy says, they're managing it and they're kind of growing comfortable in that. And I will kick us off by talking a little bit about Amy because I'm going to brag on her. Yesterday, I went down to the Southern Collective, which is in Gate City, Virginia. And it's a really, really cool little shop where they have all these artisans who, I mean, make all this stuff. And it's it's just a hub for all of that. And there's so many awesome things there from jewelry to soaps to clothing to handmade wood carved items. I mean, there's just so many awesome things. Well, I think we've shared this before, but Amy and her daughter started a little business a couple months. Well, no, it's been several months ago, right? It's been, year, yeah, she's been coming up on In one July. year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she'll be coming up on one year pretty soon. So her and her daughter started this shop. And in the middle of a pandemic, let us add, um, when, you know, any kind of entrepreneur or hustle is difficult, but they started this in the middle of the pandemic and not only did well, they're thriving. And so much so that she and her daughter, um, their shop is being featured as a vendor in this Southern collective shop in Gate City. And so yesterday was their spring open house, the debut of Amy's products there. And so I went down to see him and I was kind of just blown away because I bought a pair of earrings and my me and my daughter were talking about them later. And first of all, I love the fact that Amy does this with her daughter because what this does to see a, what is Riley? 11? 11. 11. So when On my- Friday. Friday. So when my yeah. six-year-old sees this 11-year-old who works with her mom and has her own jewelry line in a store- you should have seen my my daughter's wheels turning, you know, I mean, because that's awesome. That is so awesome at that age to be able to say that she's accomplished that and really just inspire other girls to do the same thing. But anyway, I was looking at the, the pieces that Amy had and was just kind of blown away at the quality of the stuff. And I'll let her kind of talk about what they're offering at that particular shop. But I have been blown away to watch Amy and Riley do that this year and just, I mean, really crush it. She's not going to say that, but she's crushed it from Christmas 
a holiday. I, I, I remember talking to her at Christmas and I'm like, are you, are you hanging in there? And Etsy shop during Christmas was a little, I'm sure, um, a little hairy at times, but she's just done absolutely amazing. And it's been so fun to watch that unfold and watch, you know, just as I am, we're juggling, you know, somehow making it work, somehow, you know, wearing all the hats and being able to pr- pursue something like this, which in turn is teaching your daughter how to do this. And I just love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you, friend. I appreciate that. Well, and thanks for coming out and supporting us. We did start that in January and, um, it has done well. And you know, it that old cliche is true, though. If you love something, it doesn't seem it's not work if you truly love doing it. And it really started out just a shared interest that we have in creating things that we can't creating art from things we can't stand to throw away. Right. So we are very big into upcycling as much as we possibly can. And so we had been, you know, and Riley kind of inspired this in me because ever since she's been teeny tiny, she's been doing this. She's been tearing apart things and putting them back together again as something new. And Landon does the same thing. He just thinks in a more engineering way about it. But it it began with books and we still make bookish jewelry. We clip verses from discarded books, words from discarded books and, and turn pieces into them, which is my favorite thing to do. But then we were we were branching out and thinking, you know, we use florals and we were branching out and thinking of other things that we could do. And Brian, my husband actually said, why don't you try something with coal? Because we live in the coal fields. Lots of people have a very sentimental, very close connection to coal, whether their family worked in the coal mines or it sustained their livelihood. Coal has a complicated history here and a very political history, but we're all, whatever you feel, about it. We all have it somewhere in our family and it's still built our towns and it's, you know, the coal trains are still running around, you know, running by. I saw coal trains all day yesterday. It remains an important part of our culture and people are really connecting on that level with jewelry and jewelry is, it's not just fashion. It's an heirloom. It becomes something that you give with meaning. And so that is really what gives me pleasure and, I, and Riley too about making it and knowing someone's going to get that kind of meaning out of it. So we started this new coal and river glass line. So we take pieces of broken broken glass out of the river. When you crush it, it looks like jewel. It looks like jewels. I mean, it's beautiful. I love river glass. Love it. I love to collect it. So we have cobalts. We have greens. We have ambers. We have fool's gold. We have so much beautiful stuff that just just came out of the river. And we capture that in resin. And we have pendants that range from peer- teardrops to hearts to we have all sizes. We've started rings and bracelets. We've started making earrings, as you said. And then Leslie um, Crawford asked us to come join them at Southern Collective. And we've been so grateful because she has this beautiful shop in Gate City. And she has all of these local artisans work in that shop. And so you know when you're shopping there that you're buying from local artisans you're buying culture that you can wear. And it's it's just been a real pleasure to branch out in that direction. We still have our Etsy shop, um, which is Ivy Attic Company CO. And we're still on social, but we love the fact that people can actually go into a shop and see our stuff and handle it and feel it and before they decide to buy it. I mean, they, they know that. So yes, I never really was afraid to do it. I don't, I don't think we had a fear of doing it. It was more like when we started this podcast, it was more like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. So I went into motion with what are the steps I need to take to understand this better. And, you know, I, I learned from watching other people. I learned from YouTube. I learned from joining Facebook groups where people give each other advice. That's the best place I think you can get advice really is talking to people who've done it and asking them for advice and for help. And there, there's a face group for everything. If you had asked me five years ago or even two years ago, if I had been doing this, I'd have been like, are you crazy? I don't design jewelry. I mean, it, I kind of, I don't know. I, I think maybe the Lord wanted me to do this for some reason. And and as it turns out, it's starting to bless people beyond just something to wear. It's It really has meaning for people. And so I really want to get it right. We want to get it right when we make it. We want to get it right when we, when we send it. We want to get it right when we put it in a shop. So we've learned a lot. And I think we've grown through the process. It's not been a full year. So we're still learning and, and 
but that's part of the fun, right? Is doing something that you've never done before and check in saying, okay, I wanted to do this and I'm doing this. And that makes me happy. And the podcast was the same. You know, we are, have we, we started in uh, February of last year. So we kind of missed our birthday. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to Southern Salon. So we ought to be eating cake right now. We'll have to do that next time. (laughs) We will. That's what we should do. So I really want to, I want you to tell your story because you are starting a new chapter in the work that you've been doing. And I, you know, I'm going to brag on Brittany too. Brittany's like my celebrity friend when I say I'm friends with Brittany Robertson, you know, (laughs) like the Brittany Robertson. (laughs) No, everybody knows who you are. And I feel like I know, you know, the person that you are on social, you never know what you're going to get with people on social because there's so much filtering and so much. Brittany is who she says she is on social. Brittany is the real thing. The real thing thing. I mean, you are getting exactly what you see and hear from Brittany. And that's what I love about you because you're so genuine. And I think the success that you're having is is because you come from that very genuine place. It's not posed. It's not fake. It's not because you want so many numbers of people to follow you. It has nothing to do with any of that. You just are sharing your blessings in your life. You're sharing your ups and your downs, your hardships and your joys. And I think people really connect to that. I think people really embrace that. And so I'd love for you to tell your story and then then we'll talk about how we manage those hard times. Well, first of all, thank you. That's the absolute best compliment that you could ever give me. And what I do is saying that I'm genuine um, because that's what I strive to be. And I will tell you in the area that I'm in, <laughs> that is harder than ever to do. You know, I was actually talking about this with a friend the other day. So I obviously have an Instagram page that I've kind of operated as a business for the last probably two years. And, you know, it's a brutal place. It really is as far as trying to operate and trying to grow. And I hate the word influencer because I I do not consider myself that. But I always say if you're trying to do it the right way, it should be slow and painful. What is it Dolly Parton says? She says it costs a lot to look this cheap. You know, it costs a lot (laughs) if you want to grow. Or I guess I I should say there's two different ways of growing or, or costing, I guess. I have, I've been doing that for the last several years. And And over the course of that time as well, I've also kind of helped other businesses operate their social media accounts just really by trial and error. You know, I teach, Amy and I both teach in communication studies. My area is more marketing, PR, social media, advertising, things like that. And so I've just tried to take what I've learned in that area and apply it and then learn from experience and learn from research as well. And so I've tried to, I've worked with a few businesses over the last couple of years and kind of handled their social media presence. And, you know, this past year, I had a a, a kind of an opportunity present itself and I turned it down, but it really got me thinking about the opportunity to continue doing consulting work and, and helping other businesses grow on social media on my own and doing something basically that I've already been doing it, but framing it up in a business or as a business so that I could do more. And, you know, I'm a, I guess you have to be, I know that Amy would probably say this about herself too. I'm not a risk taker, like blind leaping off the edge of the cliff, but I do consider myself somewhat of a calculated risk taker. I wasn't always this way. I always like to say when I turned 30, I realized that, oh my gosh, you know, you go through your twenties and you're like, you know, you're really trying to find yourself or whatever, whatever the find yourself generation. But then when 30 hits, you're like, okay, okay, you, you, you got to get your feet on the ground, right? And you want to start getting into a career and things like that. And I realized, I don't know, I'm probably like everybody else. My 20s went by in the blink of my eye. And one morning I woke up and I was 30 and I thought, golly, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do. But I spent the biggest part of my 20s being too afraid of what people thought about me to ever do anything that I really wanted to do. I mean, there were so many instances and so many things that I thought that I would want to do. But then in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, I better not do that. God, what people think about me. Oh, my gosh, they'll say this or they'll say this. And then at 30, I'm like, golly, you know, I mean... (laughs) <laughs> not to be morbid, but I'm inching closer to death every day. And I'm just waiting, you know, I'm wasting all of this time trying to live for 
the approval of other people. And, you know, so I made a a deal with myself that I would stop saying no to things that scared me when I turned 30. And we signed up for foster care and I started my blogging slash Instagramming within seven days of each other. So I really kind of blew the, the lid off the jar at that point. But I have in the last probably two months, framed my little consulting business up now as curated social strategy and consulting. And I'm working with several small businesses and brands, helping them manage and grow their social presence and and really just have a have an authentic experience on social media because I'm I'm huge on that. I honestly I have a love hate relationship with Instagram. Most of the time it's a hate relationship. As of late, I feel like it's been a hate relationship just because I feel like the genuineness and authenticity of it is just almost impossible to find nowadays. I mean, there are definitely accounts out there that do it well. Gosh, I mean, that could be a topic for another podcast about how that impacts us long term, you know, from teenagers to 40, 50, 60 year old women. I mean, we're all feeling it in some way. But anyway, long story short, here we both are teaching at a college, raising kids. And then here we've just decided we didn't have enough going on. So we thought we'd just, you know, start these little these little side businesses. So and Amy, you did say it wasn't that you were necessarily scared to start or that you had the fear of of, of starting, you just didn't know how to do it. I would categorize that as a fear, you know, like the fear of not being able to set it up correctly because I have done what I'm doing as a business for the last two or three years. And I could have framed it up as a business long before then, but I didn't know how to do it. And the thought of it was overwhelming and scary to me. And I think there's a point where you just literally have to close your eyes and just jump and and learn as you go. I mean, that's huge. I, I saw a wonderful, wonderful Instagram post from a girl that I follow. And she said, you know, the gist of it was like, if you're wondering if you just should start, yes, you should do it and you should start today and you will learn it as you go. And if you look back at your first Instagram picture compared to your 1000th, you're going to see your growth. Amy, if you look back at that first piece of jewelry that you made to the pieces that you're putting in shop, it's unbelievable because you're growing as you're you're learning as you're growing. You're nailing down all those pieces as you go. If you wait until you have it right, you're never going to be able to get started. That's all true. And and yes, gosh, when I think about the first few pieces and I'm I'm like, oh no, because I learned so much about what I was doing in the past few months just from practice, trial and error and things like that. One of the things circling back to the beginning when we were talking about other people and what they say, I know that people have told us, I know because they've said to us, you all look like you have the perfect, I mean, I've had people reach out to me that I haven't connected with for years and they go, oh, you look like you have the perfect life on inst- you know, on social. It looks like your life is going beautifully. It looks like everything is going perfectly. And I, I just want to be like, really? Like, you know, that's not true. You know that that, I mean, anybody knows that's not true. And that's not what I'm trying to do ever on social media. It's that, A, you don't want to burden people with your problems. I mean, sometimes you need prayer and you put that out there, but you don't you don't want to put your worst self out there when everybody else is struggling with their own issues. Now, sometimes that's helpful. You know, I've talked about hardships. You've talked about hardships that we know people can connect with. But nobody's going to do that on an everyday basis. No, there's no perfect life. And yes, we have a lot of great things going for us, but it wasn't because it just happened that way. And one of the one of the things I want to say, because I know there's some th- some people out there thinking it, is we have the benefit of having full time jobs as our foundation. And so the things that we've done that we say, you know, we took a leap of faith and did, to be honest, we haven't done what some people have done, which is a complete and utter transition, a complete and utter change where you ditch your day job and you you really take on this brand new life and you know, we interviewed D. Ayers, owner of Lynette Boutique, not long ago for a podcast, and she literally did do that. Now, she did it the right way. She did her research and she worked together with her husband and, nat- and no doubt thought about budget and all of that stuff. She didn't just wake up one day and decide to quit. But that's that does make it easier. And I will say that does make it easier when you know that you you do have your full-time job. It also makes it harder because you can't neglect your full-time job to do this. And as this work over here grows, it becomes a time management issue. And so sometimes that's like, you know, that's another fear. Can I manage all of it and nothing get sacrificed? You know, time with family, 
my own personal time, my own, you know, the things that I want to do. One of the things I realized really quickly is that making the jewelry is not what I get to do all of the time because there's also the social media aspect of it. I need, a, I, you know, when you need somebody to do your social media for you, there's really, no, when you, when you need that, when you need the marketing, when you need the processing, when people order things and you need to process it, the photography, the jewelry photography and setting up listings takes forever. It is a process. So I get this much time to create it. And then this much time goes into everything else. And so that was a lesson that I had to learn pretty quickly. And, you know, Riley is learning how to, she doesn't like that part of the business at all. And it's not the most fun. The designing is the most fun and the creating is the most fun. So that's something we've had to to learn how to do as well. I've been listening to podcasts and I've been feeding my mind with nothing but material that helps me grow as a person. So I made that commitment a couple of weeks ago to do that because I find that it makes a huge difference. So I, I listen to Brooke Castillo. Um, she's got a life coach podcast. She's wonderful. I've been listening to her every day. I listen to her on the way for, to work, on the way home from work. Um, I've been reading this book called Atomic Habits that's on the bestseller list, James Clear, um, about how to form, how we form habits, bad habits and good habits, and how you continue because getting up super early is one of the habits that I want to start creating. I don't sleep super late, but I want to get up super early and use that block of time to my advantage. And so one of the things Brooke Castillo talks about is this model of, and it really is true, and it's sort of transforming how I think about anything negative, this model of whatever you think becomes how you feel, and then that takes on an action. So if we train ourselves to control our thoughts, it will control our feelings, which will then control our actions. And she uses lots of different scenarios about that. But one of the things she says is, if you think about this model and how this works, and Napoleon Hill said the same thing. Napoleon Hill is known for the Think and Grow Rich books. And his mantra is, if you can believe it, you can achieve it, right? So it all comes back to everything starts in your mind and how you perceive something. And then everything follows that perception. So she says, for example, if you think somebody is being mean to you, then you will feel that that person's being mean to you and you will react as if they're being mean to you. If you can train your mind not to think of it that way, right? She says, nobody can make you feel bad unless you give them permission. And it takes a while to wrap your mind around that. Some of the things I'm like, I don't know if I believe you. And then I start thinking about it and she's right. And then I start practicing it and she's right. Does it happen overnight? No. But the point is, when you're thinking about doing anything hard or you're thinking about doing anything challenging, it really does begin in your head with how you're choosing to process those thoughts. I agree 125%. After this podcast, let me write her name down because I need to listen to that. And I will say, I think that's a great idea. What you mentioned about, you know, if, if you're goal driven and you're set out to do something like this, filling your mind with those things, you know, with that encouragement, whether it be biblical encouragement, whether it be personal growth encouragement. I think that's awesome. I don't do that enough. In fact, I just started listening to a podcast. I forget about podcasting. I mean, I do it and then there I I get in a a routine of listening to it and then I'll stop and I forget about it. But I've started listening to one which is not at all related to this, but I'm kind of hooked. Just shameless uh, plug. It's Joe Piazza, Under the Influence. and I'll, I'll, I'll send it out there to you, Amy. It's, it's great because it's talking about the underbelly of influencing on Instagram. But anyway, what I was getting at is you start to, and I mean, I think about this even as a parent, you start to react or your kids maybe start to react based off of your actions. Your actions come from your attitude. I can center, I can, I can start our day in our house typically really, really good or really, really crummy by the attitude that I wake up with. Um, And I need to think about that more than I do. I will say, too, something else that you mentioned, and I think this has been a huge, huge area that I'm working on right now is self-discipline. And I'll just be honest with you, I struggle a lot in that area. It is a blessing to be able to do this side job while maintaining a full-time job, but it has also become a huge sacrifice for me because, you know, my career 
the one that I've done for so long that I enjoy my teaching career is priority for me. But I have got this new career that's also taking off and I I have to have loyalty to my first while growing my second. And what that means for me is that my time needs to be much more structured. And, the you know, I say, well, I've got to get on Instagram and check an account. Gosh, this happens to me all the time, Amy. I'll say, you know, because I manage several different accounts on Instagram. I'm like, oh, I got to get on there and put up a story. And then I put up the story. And before I hit post, something catches my eye. And then 30 minutes later, I'm like, whoa, 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 where am I? What am I doing? And I've lost 30 minutes of my day. And 30 minutes sounds so silly, but it's in the big scheme of things, that's huge for me because I've lost productivity. I've lost like my mind. I've lost where I've gone, where I'm going. And it, it's really, really hard for me. So that's truly something I'm praying about right now is discipline, is being more disciplined in business. I think that's so, I'm learning. That's one of the biggest characteristics that I need for myself to run a business like this is being self-disciplined with your time, with your intentionality, with what you're listening to, what you're feeding your mind, what's, you know, the people that you're surrounding yourself with. It all calculates and it all adds up to something. You want it to add up to something good. I love the fact that you mentioned that. And maybe that's something else we could do too, is we could throw in some podcasts that we, you know, that we're listening to and, and using to motivate us. Because as Amy said, not only do you need to have encouragement from other groups of people that are doing the same thing as you are, whether it's Facebook groups or whatever, but just listening to encouraging people. That's so important. And it, and it helps shape your mindset and helps to shape your outlook. So I just, I love that you said that, Amy. That's just, that could be a topic for another day, but I think that's so important. But one of the things I'll throw in there too, at this Atomic Habits book by James Clear, he says that if you're forming a habit, that one of the ways, and this is all based on psychological research too, one of the ways that you, you can ensure that it will happen is not to make Make it a one-time action or an action that you're repeating. Make it part of your identity. So if, if I want to start getting up earlier... I don't phrase it that way. Like I want to get up earlier. I want to start getting up earlier. I start saying I'm an early riser. Then it becomes part of who I am. I'm going to be a super lark like my husband who gets up at four or four thirty. And you know, and he he kind of inspired me too because he he wanted to read more. He wanted to read more books. And he found that when he sits down to read, it makes him sleepy and you know, he never gets very far. And so but he discovered that if he reads while he's on the elliptical he can get through a, a book a week, sometimes more. And that's more than I'm reading. And he's literally, and he works out at the same time. So he can be on it for an hour and not realize he's been on the elliptical for an hour because he's so engrossed in the reading. And so okay. he's trained himself to do that. And that's really inspired me to think about, you know, how can I really maximize the time that I have? And I, I know like, one of the ways, yeah. I feel like such a sloth right now <laughs> listening to you say that because. No, I'm I mean, not doing it. I know, but that's the way that Ben is. And I'm like, hear him getting up for, uh, you know, to go work out at five o'clock in the morning and, and he'll like lean over and say, you know, bye, I love you. I have a good day or something. I'm like, hello. <laughs> You know, I've got, exactly drool. Who I I've got drool coming down my face and I'm just laying there like a big bum. So I'm just really convicted right now, Amy. I just needed to say that. We've got a lot going on. I'm just going to give us some grace. We've got a lot going on and I value my sleep and it's really hard to get up. I love my sleep. And I will say this too, I'm not making excuses, but I don't sleep well. I, I usually wake up several times in the night and that's that's my downfall when it comes to getting up super early. But... I'm going to work on that because I want to be an early riser. And and one of the things you have to do, make the plan. He says you have to make the plan and then follow through on the plan at the same time every day. Like if you want to drink water the minute that you wake up to refresh your body and hydrate your body, you need to have a bottle of water sitting on your nightstand the night before. You know, little things like that. If you want to write more thank you letters or thank you notes to people, then you have to have a fresh box of stationery sitting on your desk. That way it's there and you have the means to do it and the reminder to do it. We will just hold each other accountable for that, for our for our good habits and moving forward and the things that are going to help us maximize our time because that's one of the things that you have to do to be successful. Like I said, we get on here to be like, oh, let's share some of the things that we learn. And within five minutes, it's just ends up a therapy session for Brittany and Amy. So like I said, we've got some exciting things in store for our podcast and we look forward to joining you again. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.